Good morning and welcome to Let's Talk Autism. I'm Nancy Allspaugh Jackson. And I'm Shannon Penrod. With shades on. We because... mentioned at the, at the start of the show that this is not Halloween. I'm not doing my Ray Charles impersonation. I got a little bit of an eye infection that makes my eyes sensitive to light. So right. I'm taking a little these bit are bright easy. lights. These are bright lights, so I'm taking a little easy. Plus, which it's not pretty. Uh, you guys don't need to see that. Um, <laughs> but thrilled to be here with you. A lot of Kids have already gone back to school, but most of us are facing that in the next week or so. And it can be a very tough time. There's, like, we never want to make it sound like school is 100% perfect. No. Right? Um, but, you know, if, if we feel like it's someplace that's positive in general to go, mm -hmm. it shouldn't feel like it's the dentist's office. Let's no. say that. No. And, and you want to be realistic, but at the same time enthusiastic with your child. Absolutely. And, and focusing as much as you can on what's, what's fabulous. I know, you know, uh, it's hard. And, and, and please know that over the years when, when Jem would come home, in the beginning when he would go to school and he would come home and I would say to him, so how was today? Mm -hmm. And there was a non-response. Right. I still get the non-response. Right? <laughs> I, I, I t well, in the beginning, like, I don't think he even understood what I was asking. Mm -hmm. Non-response. He didn't understand. Then, you know, we worked on some specific things, but it was a lot of years of me asking specific things. One of the tips that we've had here on the show that so many of our experts have said is that because we, we don't know how to prompt them and we don't know what the correct response is because mm -hmm. we weren't there, we're genuinely asking the question, right. what happened? Right. And if the kids don't have that facility, then it's a failure every day. And we feel bad and they feel bad and eventually you stop. What they suggest is talking to the teacher and or the aide and saying, every day I'm going to ask him what happened. Can you send home two pieces of paper that I can prompt from? That like something about what happened in art today and that knowing that he, and that they'll, they just write you a little note saying, ask him about art, he did a really great painting. So then you would say, Wyatt, how, how was school today? Right. How did art go? Did, right. you, did you do any painting today? Right. Tell right. me about your painting. Right. And then you've got a place to go from, and that really primes the pump for the kids to be able to talk to us. And then it's really gratifying because yeah. you're, you're having something back and forth. Keep your expectations realistic. Because it's beginning. a natural thing for a kid to say when you said, what did you do at school today? Oh, not much. That, that's probably totally typical, across right? the board typical. Right. But we want to foster that, you know, back and forth. I'll tell you, the other thing that I always used to do is, because they always make such a big deal um, coming back from a break. Mm -hmm. What did you do over your summer break? What did you do over your holiday break? And it used to be the bane of my existence because Jem couldn't remember any of that. It, like he couldn't pull that from his memory and talk about it. So I would always prompt him in the days going up to the first day of school to say, so what did you do? And he would be like, nothing. And I would say, well, that's not true. Remember, we went to this museum and we did this and you saw this family member. Oh, yeah. So you gave him ideas that he could then get yes. at school. I think that helps our kiddos <clears throat> on the spectrum because they're not thinking of things the, the yeah. way the rest of us do. And those sort of filler things that teachers have to sort of keep the conversation going, they're not... They're not important to our kids, mm -hmm. but it becomes important be because if your your kiddo can't respond back, then you know it's another one of those. Ugh, there's right. a dropped ball, right. Right. right? We're hearing that unfortunately we're, we're not, not going to be able Vince to get back. Vince back. Hopefully, we got some some understanding yeah. of what the but, things he said. But you know, I, I want to reiterate the things that he was saying about make sure that you're communicating about it mm -hmm. so that it's not a shock or surprise. Make sure that you're upselling it and making it fabulous. One of the other tips I know um, that he was going to talk about is that if you have an opportunity, go to the school, mm -hmm. especially if it's a especially new school. Especially brand new, or walk if your the child's hallway, first year at school. If there's, you know, a, if there's, find out where they hang up their stuff and have them practice without mm -hmm. all the sensory stuff, so that on the first day they're there and they're set up for success that if you have the opportunity to meet the teacher beforehand and have your child meet the teacher beforehand, it's great. So many schools with all the cutbacks don't pay the teachers until the afternoon before. They literally have like one hour to set up their classrooms before school starts. It used to be, can I just tell you, that we used to have the, like days before the kids would get there, we would decorate our rooms and go all out, and then there would be an in-service where they mm -hmm. would have a guest speaker who would come and get us 
all riled up for the school year. Right. And then we would have team meetings, and it's all gone. Now the teachers get about three and a half minutes before your kids arrive to get whatever they can together. It's uh, it's a little bit hard for mm -hmm. the teachers. It's a lot hard for our kiddos on the spectrum who could do with a meeting before. Right, right. But do what you can. Use what you can. Mm -hmm. And I always say bribe people. Let them know <laughs> that you're a nice person. Let them know that you are in support of them, that you will be in support of them. Send nice notes Bring a little to the gift, teacher. Maybe. I, I, you know, I, I don't think that's a bad thing to do. And I always think the mom who wrote in and told us in the first year that we were doing Autism Live, and she said every year she gets those sheet protectors mm -hmm. and she has the back half of it be a magnet mm -hmm. um, and she puts the IEP in a sheet protector and gives it to every single person who will be interacting with the idea. child including the person who's working the cash register in the lunchroom. Great idea. And I think the vast majority of them won't necessarily know how to implement it but that's why the BIP should be mm -hmm. there too. Give that to them. It. I'll tell you, the school notices that, and they don't want to have a problem. We're, we're going to come back with In the News and talk right, about a some... school that has a problem. Right. Okay. A big yeah, problem. Yeah, we'll take a little break, and we'll be back in just a minute. Stick with us. Hi, Lisa Ackerman back with Talk of Facts. Questions, real-life questions and answers for the autism journey. Oh, are you ready for this one? Talk to me about puberty. Oh. So what I would recommend is first and foremost is the kids that have done the therapeutics, the medical, and the dietary allergen removal interventions tend to have an easier time at puberty. Seizures are really common uh, for children on the spectrum more than neurotypical populations and they're especially most common right at or about puberty time. So it's extremely important even if you have a 10 year old that you've already done an EEG that you consider before they go through puberty to get a second EEG done. Just because you have one clean EEG with no abnormal brain activity or seizure activity, you need to do another one prior to puberty. That's one of the most common calls we get with teens on the spectrum is they are often experiencing a seizure for what their family thinks is the first time. And the third thing is you're gonna have a teenager, so you're really gonna have to kick it up a notch on those life skills, social skills, and getting your kid ready to be that teenager they need to be. So if you're doing that baby thing, and I know you are, where you're maybe making their lunches or uh, helping them with laundry, we need to start bouncing some chores over to those kids. And we also need to increase social environments where they can be successful. So. Think about it. We've got three really important things that we need to look at. Puberty is a very serious issue and we take it very seriously. So make sure you have all of your therapeutics, medical and dietary interventions in place. Uh, consider to do another 24 hour EEG with your physician prior to puberty. And the third most important thing, get ready to raise the bar. Your job is to really get them ready for life. And I know you can do it. We're back with Let's Talk Autism, and we've got some stories in the news. Uh, let's start with the disturbing story about a 10-year-old boy with autism who was restrained and handcuffed yeah. by a school resource officer. If my eyes weren't bloodshot before reading this, they would have been afterward. Right. Uh, this is the kind of story that really, really um, hits home, I think, for all of us and makes me so mad that sometimes I shake. This is a, we covered this story in April, but now- Yes, it happened a while back. Back in Denton, Texas in April. And 10 year old boy uh, was restrained not once, but multiple times by mm -hmm. a resource officer at the school uh, because uh, he was following exactly the protocol mm -hmm. that he was taught mm -hmm. um, and, th and that was what he was taught to do. But they released the videotape this last week uh, so that you have an opportunity to watch it if you can stomach it. What's really upsetting to me is that the boy, they report, you know, we always talk about on this show about, well, what happened beforehand, right? That's right. the first question we always want to ask. And they reported that he was agitated all morning and that he was swinging his arms and that he, you know, was poking other students and very, very agitated. And allegedly unplugged a computer mouse and started swinging that. Okay. 
And then, the so the teacher called the resource officer and said, I'm going to need some help because she said to the boy, you need to go to this room that they have that's a, a safe room where mm -hmm. the kids can't hurt themselves. And instead of doing that, the boy went over on, of his own volition. You see him on the videotape. He goes over and he inserts himself into a cubby. Mm -hmm. So he is sitting peaceably into the cubby when the resource officer gets there with the, the body cam. Right. And, and so at that point, this is where it div I, diverges because mm -hmm. they're saying, well, he followed protocol. And I get it that when we ask a student to do something, we need to be following through with that. Completely understand. But this is where if you have somebody who's trained versus somebody who's not trained, because safety is the, the priority, right? If the child has now calmed themselves, you don't follow through on the thing. This this what makes me mad, these screen rooms that people have, they think that it's a place to send somebody in punishment. It is completely not. It should be a safe place for when they are upset. So if the child does not want to go there, it is not where you should send the child. The child put himself in the cubby and had calmed down, but they were following through with the order of, you need to go. Right. And and because he did not leave, the school resource officer went in and picked the boy up and walks out of the classroom with the boy. And and the kids started, shocker, flailing started his flailing legs, his arms and legs. Yeah. Then they got him into the screen room. The screen room. They don't call it a screen room, but you know that's what it they is. They put handcuffs on him twice. Twice. And and you know what I do appreciate is that the resource officer is is most of the time talking in a very calm voice and you know in a level voice and he's saying things to the boy um, but if you understand children with autism and a 10 year old with autism the way he's talking to him is as if he's talking to somebody who's perpetrated a crime right right and he's staying calm and it really is textbook what what a police team would teach somebody to do and this is uh, this is where problem number two is because after they've evaluated the tape, the school district has said, "Well, all of our people followed the protocol, and we were taught by the police department, and these are techniques that are used by the police department, and and so we are following the protocol." And my thing is, well, how's that working for the police? Like, it's the police that need to be taught techniques to de-escalate things and how to get it not to the point of cut of cuffing people and not to the point of cuffing a 10 year old. So when a school district says to me, well, we were trained by the police department, I want to run screaming into traffic and going, this is completely bass backwards, right? It's the police that need to get trained mm -hmm. first right. and not have police that are already doing these things that we, the news is filled with things where people are saying the police have gone too far, they escalated something when they didn't have to, and why are we letting them train the police on how to deal with a 10-year-old for a school? I just want to scream. Yeah, there, there were many other options for de-escalating this situation so instead many. of escalating it. And, and the it family is hard. Moment, right. Go key ahead. moment when he was in the cubby where they could have just stopped everything right, right there and said, Okay, are you feeling calm? Yeah. Do you want to go to the room to calm right. down for a little bit? Do you want to have a break? No. We put in a demand. You got to follow through. Right. Well, that and then look well, what the, happened. The family's hired an attorney, so we'll be following they this should. case. Yeah. Because that is the only way. And and I I don't know if you read the comments on the story that I printed up here, but there were comments from people saying, "Well, that child should be homeschooled," um, and that that's things, not the answer, right? And it is not the answer at all. And people saying, well, that family is just looking to make a buck. I got to tell you something. I bet you not. I bet you not. I have seen this mom talking on the news, and, and she cries and says, he's a 10-year-old. Right. Why did it have to get to this point? And honestly, I have been in circumstances before where I could have filed suit, and I chose not to because I was like, I don't want to do that. But you know what? The problem persisted. And I'm telling you that it, this is the only way that school districts here is if you say you're doing it wrong and I'm taking you to the bank on this, that's the only way it changes. And next time it will be your child. 
So, um, ugh, it makes me mad when people go, well, that child should just have stayed home. No. That's There's not laws the answer. against that. There are. Thank and you very much. Isolating the child is not the answer. Free, appropriate public education. Okay, we have some scientific stories in the news. One yeah. is from Science Daily that there's potential biomarkers for autism in infancy. Yes. Um, a study of young children with autism spectrum disorder revealed altered brain waves compared to typically developing children during a motor control task. And isn't this interesting? We keep hearing about these micro movements mm -hmm. that kids on the spectrum make that the more we delve into this, we find the earlier that uh, autism can be diagnosed. And this is essential because the, if we can diagnose early enough, the child won't be behind. And then, because a lot of what happens with autism is we have to catch the child up um, from skill acquisition. So if you can diagnose early, what an amazing thing. Uh, I, I found it really interesting that they looked at five to seven year olds and they played a video game that required them to press a button to feed a puppy. Mm -hmm. And they found that in the children with autism, it, it was a longer reaction right. time and reduced uh, gamma, oscillations gamma oscillations in their brains right. and, and that it, it, it was in line with the severity of their symptoms. Mm -hmm. So the more severe their autism presented itself, the more severe the lag was. Um, so being able to look at that and you know, it, it really makes me wonder because a lot of our kids, not all, but many of our kids are into video games mm -hmm. and I, and we, the, we started on video games originally because they were talking about the mirror neurons lighting mm -hmm. up, which is going to affect our next story. And that when using games like the Wii Fit, right. where they see an image that is them and mm -hmm. they move and mm -hmm. it moves, that it was helping kids with autism to light up their mirror right, neurons, right. which would help with other things spatially and for them not to be... Uh, when you and I watch the Olympics and we see somebody just you know, ski down a mountain hill, the part of our brain, if we were doing it, mm -hmm. uh, lights up because it mirrors what the activity is doing that kiddos with, the, with autism, not so much. So we went all in on video games. Many people say that it's not a good thing for kids <sighs> with autism, but I'm wondering if it helps with the reaction. Time. Yeah, yeah. Okay, one last story, and then we got to get to our guest. Uh, neuroscientists have an array of tools for understanding the brain, and one of the most impressive approaches involves implanting electrodes into the brain to record neuron activity. Um, it's invasive, yes, but sometimes it's necessary for medical reasons. Um, in the cases of epilepsy, for example. Epilepsy neuron, that it can't be treated by medicine. Exactly. Neurons have been implanted. And this is called, here's the technical name for it, intracranial electrocephalography. And, or and, I, encephalophagy. I, <laughs> no, we both feel. Neither one of us are very good. Uh, but it's I-E-E-G. It's gaining popularity. Okay, so and, the thing about this that I find interesting is it's very small mm -hmm. uh, the, the case that they've looked at two individuals who had epilepsy and happened to also have autism. They were treating the epilepsy. But what they discovered was in the amygdala, 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 amygdala thank you, um, that when they looked at faces, the amygdala did not react in the way that people who don't have autism right. react. Right. Uh, so more that we know about the brain, we know that the autism brain does not recognize faces in the way, but it literally shows up mm -hmm. in the reaction of the amygdala. So we're honing in on what part of the brain is affected by this. And what they've been able to do for epilepsy when they put these electrodes in is that they can record what's happening with the brain. But the truth of the matter is, is that they know that they can send signals back the other way too. Right. And so they, in the future, they want to look at if we send an electrical current in, does it wake up that part of the brain? And would that part of the brain then recognize faces in the same way? Mm -hmm. It's all very cutting edge and it's all very controversial. Uh, we were talking before the show about the fact that I'd love to have John Elder Robeson on the show to talk about uh, the, uh, the magnet therapy that he had on his brain. Uh -huh. John Elder Robeson, who is brilliant and an artist and a writer, and uh, he is one of the most respected self-advocates in the autism community and you know would tell you and tell anyone that there's nothing wrong with having autism his right. brain works differently right. but he had this therapy to see if he could see mm -hmm. what he might 
be missing. Right. And it was very emotional for him because he, for a brief period of time, saw colors in a completely different way that he now believes is the way that you and I see colors, mm -hmm. and he was never seeing them that yeah. way. So, and you and I both talked before the show about if I had the opportunity for a day to have somebody do something to me where I could feel what it is like to be a person with autism, I would sign up in a I heartbeat. I would sign up in a heartbeat as well. I'd love to have that opportunity. To, to have that ability to see what is it like mm -hmm. from from this different viewpoint, from this different vantage point. Yeah. So it might this might be to interesting yeah. things. Uh, check it out. Cutting edge, once yes. again. All right. It's in Spectrum News. All right, we have a uh, wonderful guest. guest who's going to be with us in just a few minutes. We're going to take a short break, and then J.R. Reed is going to be with us talking about how he received a diagnosis and why he is a self-advocate and, and what he's doing about that and the particular age range that he's targeting, hoping to help. Yeah, So okay. we'll be right back. Stick with us. Hi, I'm Yvonne Johansson, and this is My Little House. My Little House is an interactive, multi-sensory, educational felt toy that I invented to help develop children's language skills. I love my little house. I've been working as a speech therapist for over 20 years. I have spent my entire career working with young children. I work with children with language delays, and I have many children with significant cognitive disabilities and children on the autism spectrum. It has been a constant challenge finding toys that are fun, educational, and actually engage my students. In every preschool since I've been a young therapist, we carry on these felt boards. Kids love them because they're soft and they're fluffy and there's usually these little pieces that attach to these boards because felt sticks onto felt. You bring them into the activity because they're now they're putting a piece on the board. So it's almost kind of like magic. So then I just thought, wouldn't it be great if I could just take this one-dimensional board and make it into an actual three-dimensional toy? How cool would that be? That's the idea behind My Little House. You can spread it out flat like a four panel felt board, or here's the cool part. In the blink of an eye, My Little House easily converts into a three dimensional reversible house. This is the outside, this is the inside. My Little House comes with 36 felt cutout pieces that match outlines in eight colorful rooms, and they're felt so they stick. Each piece inside my little house has been placed with purpose. For instance, in the kitchen, whole half, under, on top, inside, big, bigger, and biggest, empty and full, circle, triangle, inside, outside. Really cool thing, I have a nonprofit, Lecotech. They are the folks that put out the Differently Able Guide for Toys R Us. They've been doing it for 25 years. They gave me their seal of approval as a toy that they feel is a toy with purpose and that will make a difference. But My Little House isn't just for kids on the spectrum or with significant disorders. It's also for typically developing two to five year olds. It's a fun toy. Recently, I took My Little House to the American Speech and Hearing Association convention in Philadelphia, and the response from my peers was overwhelming. Hundreds of therapists, teachers, and heads of school districts wanted to order them. It was real validation for me that this truly is a toy that needs to get out there. Hi, I'm Shannon Penrod. I'm a proud autism mom, I'm a former educator, and I am the host of Autism Live. And as all three of those things, I want to recommend to you My Little House. This is one of the smartest toys I have ever seen for teaching language to kids who have emerging language. Whether they're on the autism spectrum or completely neurotypical, it's a great, fun, reinforcing toy, but it's especially great for our kids that are on the autism spectrum because it makes learning fun and it makes it tactile. They have these felt shapes and they get to match them up. And I'm telling you, even the adults love to play with this. We loved this toy so much that we wanted to be able to bring it to you at a great discount. So right now, if you will go to www.smartfelttoys, and when you get to the coupon code, put in a-live.com, you'll get $5 off. Isn't that great? 
And so I want to encourage you, go and get my little house for all the kiddos in your life. And we are back with Let's Talk Autism. And as we said, we have a special guest with us today. J.R. Reed is coming to us from the Ozarks, um, where he moved from Long Beach about a year ago. How you like it there in the Ozarks, J.R.? You know, I, I really like it. As uh, somebody with Asperger's, the sensory overload alone is just amazing. Um, you know, I go from traffic and lights and stuff going on 24 seven all the time to two lakes within five minutes of my house and trees and nature and quiet. Remarkable. So, so that sounds like it's been very good for you. You were just, you were 46 when you were diagnosed with Asperger's. Why, why so late? Well, I was out of high school for 10 years before there was even autism that was talked about in people in school. In my 30s, I tried to get diagnosed by two different doctors, and they both said that they would not test me because they saw no point in knowing what the problems were. Um, I, I wanted to know what it was. I want to know, am I just weird, or is there something wrong with me? I wanted a name for it so I could know how to research it and if there were ways that I could, you know, find some little tips and tricks to get around it. And you mentioned you wanted to know if you were weird. Do you feel like you were treated differently and that you were made to feel different as as a young man? Oh, I, I, I played ice hockey for 20 years recreationally, and I would not even use the words that I was called a lot by kids. But I had from fifth grade through high school, I was called weird, stupid, and lazy by most of my teachers, even though my IQ is enough to make me not stupid. I'm just curious, for so many of the adults that we talk to when they get the diagnosis late, um, they report that a lot of things start to make sense for them. Uh, Absolutely. Was it like that for you? Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I, I had a boss that for four years in, uh, called me Forrest Gump to my face in staff meetings and sales meetings, would call me Forrest Gump. And it was nice that I could just go online and research and find out about Asperger's and, you know, what the different traits were. And now I had an explanation for my traits. And, you know, I knew then that I could kind of change my lifestyle a little bit to avoid a lot of the sensory overload and a lot of the things that would trigger the what I used to call weird and anger moments that I know now were just the meltdowns and kind of the free meltdowns that are caused by sensory no kidding <clears throat> talk about some of the books that you've written uh, your first book an Asperger's Guide to Dating Neurotypicals. What Tell us about um, that book. That book, uh, that's the only book that's actually been published. Okay. Um, that That is a lot of my dating experience and marriage. Um, it really has a lot to do with communication because I just, in, in every relationship, communication is so important. But I think in a relationship between a high-functioning autistic and a neurotypical, you've really got to crank that that up because we don't read facial cues well. We don't read tone of voice real well. So, and, and here's the example I use. You know, if somebody says, hey, you know, I won free tickets to this concert, somebody goes, oh, you suck. Well, they mean it, you know, in a teasing way, like, hey, congratulations, you know, I wish I would have won. Right. But, but the Asperger person might think, darn, they're really mad at me. So if you just, just a simple question, like, are you angry about that? Or, or can you explain that to me? Just a, a simple question. And that makes all the difference in the world and keeps you from being upset all day or being in a funk or to have a great day. Yeah. And in the dating world, that can make the difference of a successful date or never seeing the person again. Right. 
Uh, absolutely. And, you know, in, it makes a difference in a relationship, too. You know, I, and the, the principles that I talk about are communication, respect, honesty, understanding. All, all great things. Now, do you describe yourself as a self-advocate? Oh, absolutely. I, I am a self-advocate, and I also work with kids from uh, high school on up through adult. Um, I work with uh, neurotypicals as well as uh, people that are on the spectrum. I help do training with uh, first responders. And uh, this school year already, I've uh, started booking times to work with two different school districts to speak with the uh, neurotypical kids to explain to them who we are, that we're not all Sheldon Cooper from the Big Bang Theory. Right. Although some of us are a little more like him than we'd like to admit. But I'm also working with the autistic kids to try to explain to them a little bit about how to feel better about themselves and talk to them about how they can work to fit in with the neurotypical kids and really integrate. I'm a, I'm a big proponent of neurodiversity. Absolutely. And one of your one of the things that you say is that autism is not a disability. It's a different way of looking at things. Absolutely. <clears throat> um, in, in the book, I belong to a uh, Facebook group, uh, Asperger's Life Support. And I put out there, I said, hey, I'm looking for a couple examples of how to explain the differences between a neurotypical brain and an autistic brain. And the electrician gave me a, a great example. He said, it's like Christmas lights. Uh, string of Christmas lights, if one bulb burns out, some lights, <clears throat> the whole light, the whole string burns out, some just the one bulb burns out. But once you replace that bulb, everything works again. Now you also have a blog, is that correct? I have a blog called Not Weird, Just Autistic. <clears throat> Because my whole life, I grew up until age 46 thinking I was weird, and now I'm autistic. Although, as it's been pointed out to me many times, with the purple goatee, <laughs> now I'm both weird and autistic. <laughs> and especially in my community near Branson, Missouri, where it's a community of about 15,000 people, I, I can't hide with a purple goatee like I could in Long Beach, you know? Right, right. Um, um, it would, and back to talking about the books real quick. I right. am working on a book called Autism Isn't Contagious, and that's geared more towards neurotypicals explaining who we are and how they can accept us and integrate us into their society. And I'm writing one called Asperger's Is My Superpower, which is kind of the story of me going from childhood up until my diagnosis. Okay. And you mentioned that you deal with a lot of depression, anxiety. What it, does that? It, it tends to come with autism. That does tend to come with autism. In fact, when I speak and I and when I blog, I, I call them autism's evil cousins. Okay. And do you have any tips for dealing with those when you talk with others? Um. Just that you know, talk to a psychiatrist you know, psychologist, you know, if you need to be on some medicine, it, it's not necessarily a bad thing to be on medicine. It's not the stigma that it used to be. And I find, you know, a lot of help in talking to uh, psychologists. And the funny thing is, when I lived in Long Beach, it was two hours away for me to find the closest psychologist that specialized in autism. Out here, I've got one 45 minutes away. Well, that's great, and I'm, I know. And yeah. you also have a service dog, I understand. I have a service dog named Ty who comes from a place called Dogs Nation. Uh, they use only rescue dogs. Ty was actually found as a puppy in a garbage bag in a dumpster and taken to a shelter. <laughs> and uh, Dogs Nation works with several shelters, and if the shelter director thinks they can be a service dog, They'll contact Dogs Nation. Dogs Nation will come out and spend a day or so with the dogs. If they think that they can be a service dog, they'll take them. If they end up not being able to be a service dog, 
then they will adopt them out just like a uh, shelter would. And does that help you with your with your anxiety and depression? It, it helps with the anxiety, it, and it also helps when I'm out. I mean, he does things like when I'm in line at a grocery store, he'll he'll get behind me and keep a little distance between me and the person behind me. Or if I'm talking to somebody and they seem to get a little too close to me, <clears throat> he'll get about two feet in front of me to keep that little barrier so I, I don't feel like I'm being smothered by somebody. Right. Amazing. Tell us and, your... yeah, Go but, ahead. But, but the problem is he's so cute that I think people actually kind of are my friends sometimes because they like Ty more than me. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> Tell us where um, our listeners can get your book um, and how uh, they can reach on, you. Uh, well, they can buy an autographed copy, which is the same price as anywhere else at <clears throat> jrreadauthor.com. Uh, it's also available on Kindle, and it will be available on Audible by the end of the summer, and it's available on Amazon US, UK, and Europe. Okay. And the book is 749. And right, you got right. a podcast coming soon. Uh, yep, I'm uh, working on another co uh, co-host for me. And I'm going to do a weekly podcast called Not Weird, Just Autistic. And I do some occasional videos that I put up on my site that if I actually get my button gear, I'm going to start doing a little bit more of those. Very cool. Okay. And I do a weekly column for a very large site called Good Men Project, goodmenproject.com. I do a column on Sundays called Not We're Just Autistic. And they have a weekly group mental health call that anybody can call into on Thursday nights. And I host that. And how can people find that, JR? Uh, they can go to goodmenproject.com and there's a link to the uh, social interest calls. Wonderful. Okay. Well, we'll be looking forward to hearing more about your projects and your books and uh, hopefully um, all the great things you're up to. Thank you for everything. Thank you so much. Hey, well, thank you. Thank you for everything. And by the way, thank you for everything you do for promoting the cause. Oh, you're I, welcome. You. As, as somebody who is on the spectrum, I really, really appreciate all that you do. Thank well, you so much. We're thrilled that no you're out there setting an example for our young men. It's a wonderful thing. I, I do my best. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Okay, have a great day. All right, bye thank bye. you. Bye. All right, <laughs> and we're gonna take a short break and we'll be back. Talk to us a little bit about what your degree is in. City planning or urban planning. I got it from Cal State Northridge with a degree in cinema and television arts with an emphasis in screenwriting. And what are you interested in, Eli? Um, a video game internship. Computer programming? I'm hoping to combine entertainment or travel my two passions. Ooh, what kind of jobs have you worked? Bakery inventory. Okay, inventory. Talk about your volunteer job. I'll push your guy to help too, to help the soldiers. You volunteered to help the soldiers? Yes. I interned in the national parks in the Santa Monica Mountains, which is very urban mm -hmm. area. So I worked with the uh, situ problems of how it's impacting the surrounding community, like the, uh, the flow of traffic and the flow of people and what they could do to plan in the parking. I've been to China. I've been all around Europe. I've been to Thailand, Japan, Australia. You can create an app? That's impressive. Yeah. Really cool thing. Can you teach other people how to make yeah. an app? If you have a choice between uh, working or not working. Working. You like working. Yes. Why? What do you like about working? It is fun. I would work. Yeah? You would choose work? Why? Because I have to get more of that. Um, get, um, get paid and enjoy, enjoy it and want to make sure I have enough money so I can save it. Why do you need to have a full-time job? I mean, it's kind of like a duh thing, right? Oh, no, obviously, so <laughs> yeah. I can support myself. Right. And hopefully a family down the line, but at least at first, my, myself. I'm very dependable and uh, always reliable and get to my job on time. What excites you about working a job or being an intern? 
learning new skills. Yeah. What has it meant to you having this job and having the stability of a job that you've had for multiple years? It's meant the world because I'm able to do everything, that, almost everything I wanted to do because of that job. We're back with Let's Talk Autism, and we, we said question. we got a question come in. Cynthia wrote in and said, how does eating and autism go hand in hand? I know they do. My two boys have recently been diagnosed, and they are super picky. I had a bad feeling. I fe No, excuse me. I feel bad feeding them the same thing, but that's all they will eat. Okay. That's Great very question. common. <clears throat> very common that uh, a kid on the spectrum is a picky eater. It tends to go very, with the territory. Yeah, it does. Um, but okay, let's talk about a couple of different yeah, things. There's that... so many things you can do and ways you can go. Absolutely. It's a big question. Uh, it is a big question. And we've done a lot of videos on feeding and you might want to check and see what some of our experts have said. But um, the first thing that we want to make sure is that the child is thriving. If they're eating enough so that they're staying healthy and they're not super, super skinny, um, you know, there's other things that you can be working on. We want to work on uh, desensitizing them to foods that they are really aversive to, but there's a time and a place for that. So, for instance, if your child will not eat spinach, but they're eating at least occasionally a green vegetable, you know, life goes on. You don't have to have them be able to eat spinach when they're four. Probably right? what you're mm -hmm. finding is that they're only attracted to carbohydrate foods. Very likely. You know, cheese and carbs. That tends to be dairy and carbs tend Potatoes, to be what Potatoes, the chicken they nuggets. Want. Right. I used to call it the, you know, the tan food. Yeah, white I call it the white food. food diet. Right. And that that's all that they want to eat. I will say that there are lots of different diets that are out there for autism, and one of them that's across the board that people generally try is the gluten-free, casein-free diet. And, and always the parents that come to me and say, I just don't want to do that. I don't think that that's really, it. their children are almost always the kids who are just eating the white food right. stuff, right? Right. And, and so the fear is there's not going to be something else for them to eat. The truth of the matter is, is that gluten-free chicken nuggets are available in every single grocery store As now. As are gluten-free pastas, mm. gluten-free bread, yes. dairy-free. All of these are available substitutes. Yes. For the same food. So what you can do uh, to try the gluten-free diet, because a lot of times it doesn't work for everybody, but for some kids we see that it frees up their guts, mm -hmm. uh, which frees up their language, which frees them up to be able to learn. And then in the course of that, they are be willing to eat other things. Mm -hmm. So the first thing you could do is take gluten and dairy out of their diet and have all those substitutes. Uh, we should put together a list of which ones are the good ones because there are bad chicken nuggets that are gluten free and there are good ones. And there's bad cheese and good cheese. Oh, yeah. And can I just say that there is a particular kind of, of chicken nugget that my nieces who are not on a gluten free diet uh -huh. and visit, they always like, can we get the good chicken nuggets? And what they mean is the gluten free ones. Uh -huh. They're not cheap, but mm -hmm. we, we buy them when they're on sale. Yeah, a lot of these foods are a little mm -hmm. bit more expensive, so you should be forewarned about that. Yeah, but if you if you watch the sales and stock up and freeze things, you know, you can make it through, because we've all done it on a dime. But I will say this, that what if you really, really, really want to have your child introduce more flavors and more colors and more textures, there's one method that they have found to across the board, as long as there is nothing medically wrong that the child can swallow, you know, um, that works, okay? And what that is, is mixing it in with something that they like by grains of sand. So the example that they always would talk about in workshops is chocolate and spinach. Mm -hmm. So if you want the child, the child loves chocolate and you want them to eat spinach, you take like a piece of spinach that is so small you can't even recognize it to the human eye and mix it in with some chocolate. The child won't notice, right? Then you put just a little bit more, and it might take you three months to the point where you're putting a piece of spinach this big in with a chocolate, and a year to the point where the child is having spinach with one little shaving of chocolate on the top. And I know it sounds disgusting, but they can get a kid to eat anything doing this. You can also use the reward principle, which is to give them a tiny bit of the unpreferred food and then the reward food right afterwards. Absolutely. 
And all of these things, I mean, there's great cookbooks out there where you can sneak vegetables into things. Look, I don't do this for my son. I do it for my husband. <laughs> I sneak broccoli and carrots into a meatloaf. He doesn't know. Yeah, yeah. I sneak zucchini and carrot juice into muffins mm -hmm. that my husband and my son eat up like, you know, they're candy. Right, right. And, and what that does is it acclimatizes their taste buds to what's happening. Right.